perfect. They kiss it because it can feed us and shelter us and even save us from climate change. In its perfect design, the Earth uses the soil to draw down carbon from the air to feed us and keep the planet healthy, even man-made carbon. But with billions of acres of soil harmed by chemicals, that process is stopped, trapping that carbon in the air and causing our climate to change. If we restore the soil, it will once again take that carbon back from the air and put it back underground, back where it belongs, back where it was meant to be. Next up, we have two uh, gentlemen who use the uh, art of film to spread their message. Steve uh, Mickelson is the executive director of the Fund for Sustainable Tomorrow and the executive producer of the video project. Uh, and James Brundage is a filmmaker for First Light Films. He's worked on numerous television shows for uh, several big hitter TV shows, PBS, or stations rather, PBS, BBC, TBS, Discovery, and more. I will turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor to follow that last panel. There was a lot of alternative thinking, and it's great to see that the climate discussion is crossing the boundaries into uh, you know, really full-term solutions. I'm going to take a, a personal moment here after seeing that wonderful Antarctic show, Antarctic show last night. Um, in 1996, I spent a season there and shot a show called Warnings from the Ice, which showed on Nova in 1997. I got a little silly when I got to the South Pole, but I can't believe we're still talking about this. And Warnings from the Ice, 1997. Here you have it. We've seen this, this image many times over the course of the last couple days. And I'm trying to get my cursor to follow me. Oh, well. It's the blue marble. It provides everything we need, water, food, oxygen. Most of us take these things for granted. We exploit this bounty without understanding the consequences, and the planet is suffering. This situation is really out of whack. We've been talking a lot about that these last couple of days. And fixing that relationship with nature and the planet is, I think, the most critical, critical chore for the 21st century. And that is the central chore for Nature Needs Half. We need to ask not what does humanity need, but what does nature need? It's a question of self-interest, of our own survival, really. But we must also recognize that we are not the only Earthlings. We are one species among millions, and it's time to live up to our obligations as stewards of the world. And make no mistake about it, we are now in charge. To the extent that we have instigated a new geologic age, the Anthropocene, the age of man. Humans and their domestic animals have replaced most other organisms and profoundly changed the Earth from the chemistry of the ocean to the temperature of the atmosphere. I'm not suggesting that this is an evil plot. The industrial and technology revolutions have created an age of abundance and comfort. We're all, most of us are warm and well-fed. We can travel the world. You know, who could resist that? In other parts of the world, even when not fueled by the fossil fuel level of consumption, it's still a huge impact made by seven billion people. A century ago, a few visionaries started to understand the impact of the industrial revolution, 
and they tried to start saving nature. They fought to protect the last best places. And this was the birthplace of America's best idea, the National Park. Yellowstone became the world's first national park in 1872. The second national park was in Australia, 1879. In South Africa, they made Imphalozi, where the white rhino was saved from extinction. In the Congo, Virunga, to protect the last mountain gorillas. Even in Europe, the last European ibex was saved by the creation of Grand Paradiso Park. These parks became the containers for nature. Wild, wildlife had a safe home. Outside of the parks, the world could be exploited for the greatest profit. It appeared that this was working. But even while we were making all those wonderful national parks, here's what has, what has happened to nature. These large mammals represent what has happened to everything else, birds, fish, amphibians, amphibians insects. It all adds up to this. Our impact is comparable to the comet which wiped out the dinosaurs. So why aren't this system of national parks working to save nature? Well, there's a map of the protected areas in the US and Canada. It's not the yellow spots, it's the little purple ones. Kind of looks like a bunch of islands, doesn't it? Well, in the 1960s, E.O. Wilson and Robert MacArthur published an important paper about research they did in the Florida Keys. They came up with two important pr principles. The smaller the island, the fewer species it can support. And the farther it is from other islands, again, fewer species will be found. Why is that important? Because our national parks are biologically speaking islands. Most parks around the world are surrounded by human development, farms, roads, cities and towns, in many places, wild animals can't get in or get out, and when they do, they are killed in conflicts over predation and crop damage. As the extent of the extinction crisis began to be understood, Michael Soule and other biologists created the field of conservation biology. The first thing they looked at was how big should these parks be to hold on to all their species, which leads to another question, how many animals of each, how many individuals of each species do you need for that species to survive? The African lion is a good example. It turns out you need a thousand lions, a thousand breeding individuals, not just kids, to have a sustainable population. Here's a map of all the protected areas in Africa. Only four of them have a thousand lions. That means lions will die out of every place in Africa but four parks that are big enough. Is that enough protection? If you add up all the protected areas in the world, terrestrial and marine, here's what you get. How much is enough? What does nature need? In 1992, people started thinking about this. They convened the Rio Earth Summit. We've heard a lot about one group that was created in 1992, the United Nations Framework for Climate Change. They worked for years making all the agreements we've talked about up to the Paris Accord. But there was another group that was created. That's the Convention on Biological Convert uh, Diversity. It was formed to confront the global collapse of wildlife populations. After a few years of discussion, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, came up with these targets for conservation. 12% of land, 5% of water. This is the number of scientific studies that those were based on. They were based not on what nature needs, they were based on what policymakers thought they could get. And if you ask scientists and policymakers how much land we should protect, you get a very different answer. Who should we believe? In 2009, Harvey Locke, who created Yellowstone Yukon Conservation Initiative, announced a new idea, nature needs half. He looked at the data and it really showed, study after study, that if we want to have a fully functioning planet into the foreseeable future, we need to protect half of the land 
and half of the ocean. This is not an exact figure, but a realistic science-based goal that could repair our relationship with nature. It's a bigger version of conservation than we have ever imagined. It took me a while to make this point, but frankly, it took me a long time to get to this point. When we first talked about nature needs half, I said, gosh, that's a big ask. How are we going to do that? But since then, over the last 30 years, I have made conservation films about elephants, about lions, grizzly bears, humpback chub. And, and there, each, each of these films was attached to a campaign to save this or that. And each one of them was really, really worthy. But as I tried to promote these individual causes, I came to understand that what we need going forward is a simple, clear conservation message about our story and our relationship to the planet. And if you want to get over these days, you better be able to tweet it. Nature needs half. This can travel around the world. It can support everything from elephant conservation to saving the snail darter. And the idea is catching on. E.O. Wilson's latest book has the same proposal. He calls it Half Earth, which was published seven years after we announced Nature Needs Half in Merida, Mexico. It really is about a new story of living on the planet. Many traditional people know that the Earth is a very large living thing. Humanity is one part of a single, complex, interdependent system, and we must understand that or perish, taking a huge number of other species with us. We need a relationship with nature that is thoughtful and balanced and gives her what she needs and what we all need to flourish, half and half. 50% sounds like a fair deal. Here's a few places in the U.S. where it has already accomplished. It's possible, it's desirable, it's a really good and effective idea. And it's not such a tall order. People like nature. Communities that integrate nature and help are happier and healthier places to live. Density and nature are not enemies. They can work together for everyone's benefit. I want to look at a couple places around the world where conservation of scale is already happening. Here's Bhutan, who have embraced gross national happiness as opposed to gross national product. They have protected 51.4% of all of their land in a system of, of parks and protected areas, and they are all connected by functioning corridors. It's a big idea, and it works. And it goes from the high altitude. Here we have the Himalaya, where the snow leopard is the umbrella species, all the way down to lowland jungles, where they have a very good, healthy population of Bengal tigers. This is an illustration of one of the principles of, connect of conservation biology that Nature Needs Half addresses. You need to protect every kind of ecosystem to have a whole functioning planet. I'd like to look at another area where, in fact, nature needs more than half. In the Amazon, the easterly winds blow moisture from the Atlantic Ocean across the Amazon basin. The moisture precipitates, falls in rain, falls as rain, and is transpired back into the atmosphere and keeps moving west. Every drop of rain falls many times, as many as 11 or 12 times, before it reaches the Andes. If you lose a big chunk of the rainforest, you lose the rain. And that is a problem not only for the Amazon, but this biopump circulates moisture north to the American breadbasket, south and east to Central Africa. Thomas Lovejoy did a lot of research about how much of the rainforest needs to be protected. He estimated that 80% of the forest is required or you end up with no forest at all. About half is protected now, so we need to protect another third. In addition to being a weather machine for the planet, the Amazon is also a huge source of CO2 to oxygen conversion. Some people call it the lungs of the planet. But as you have heard from many of these ocean experts here in the last couple of days, the ocean is the real lungs of the planet. It has 
I have heard two out of every three breaths come from, of oxygen come from the ocean. And like the Amazon, we need to protect a critical mass or the whole system could collapse. Luckily, marine protection is starting to catch on. Barack Obama has just created the largest marine protected area in the world, almost a million square kilometers. Worldwide, marine protection is now over 3%. This group of scientists looked at that, that the CBD goals of 5% and said, how much of the ocean do we really need to protect? They said 35%. This group looked at that study and said, not enough. If you really want to save the whole system, we need more than a third. How about half? And do you remember the two groups that were created at the Rio summit? Protecting half the Earth's land and oceans would also be a giant leap forward in mitigating climate change. Just to, just to stop cutting down primary forests would reduce a huge source of CO2, maybe 25% of current emissions, and it could happen really quickly. This points out an idea as time has really come, the global commons, things, shared resources like the oceans and the atmosphere that every creature on Earth relies on. In Antarctica, we've actually managed to pull that off. The Antarctic Treaty of 1948 creates a mechanism for sharing the continent and all its resources, and that has worked. This is also where we discovered the ozone hole. We made a treaty about controlling CFSCs, and enough people have gone along that the ozone hole is improving. And here's a bit of new news that I just got from a friend yesterday. China has done the first wilderness resource study, and it looks like they could do 52.5%. Nature needs half could happen in all places, China. And of course, the Paris Accord is, a, is testimony that we can do big ideas on a large scale. This is a perfect opportunity to act local and think global. So protect your favorite place and do what you can locally. As far as thinking globally, the Convention on Biodiversity is still working on it. You remember they started with these numbers in 1994. They were revised in 2010. You think that's enough? They're meeting again in 2020 to revise the conservation targets. We need to raise our voices and push them to the solution that needs to happen. Nature needs half. Now, how are we going to get there? We're going to build a movement. And to build a movement, we're taking a multimedia approach across many platforms and social media. And the person who is spearheading that is my partner here, Steve Michelson. Thanks, James. Uh, pleasure to be back here again. Thanks, Sally and Chip. This is. Uh, a uh, great honor to be supporting James and his wife, Chelsea, who's here, Aspen residents, on a very noble and large mission, one of the largest we've ever taken on through the video project. We're, we're a distribution company specializing in the environment and uh, have about 350 films in our library. And we've come to a juncture in the road as we've done research about the landscape of media. We've discovered that uh, there are two large demographics in this country. The baby boomers, my generation, 72 million of us are starting to die off, uh, and 75 million millennials who could not have a more different media diet and media expectation than the baby boomers. Baby boomers watch long form films and media millennials want to see films in very short, sometimes seven to 10 seconds, maybe two minutes might be the longest you'll ever have a millennial see your, your media. So this really proposes a challenge, and as a result, our, our new foundation, the Fund for Sustainable Tomorrows, has raised some money, a considerable amount of money, to develop a new platform for the 21st century. It's called Media 186, Media at the Speed of Light. And our funder, who happened to know my ancestral connection to Albert Michelson, who discovered the speed of light, uh, decided that was, a, sure enough, a good name to create the kind of impact that was needed quickly. Um, so Media 186 has been born. We want to tell stories that are vital to our future. 
stories about the environment, stories about social justice, stories about health, which are now overlapping the environment as you've been listening to earlier. Um, and we have come up with a new paradigm of how this will all work. A new story architecture, which involves long form, short form, uh, short form in the, in the less than 30 seconds that you can submit on social media and people can watch on their way to work or whenever they have a moment. And then uh, middle forms as well in the 25 to 30 minute range, which can be part of an activist oriented engagement uh, meeting. Uh, traditional media distribution is not the revenue center it used to be, it's more of the marketing for the social media and the campaigns that we create and all of which has to lead to impact, and that's what our new platform is all about. It, we want to go beyond what social media is today. Views, likes, shares, those are all great, but we're not quite sure what that really accomplishes other than a pat on the back of somebody having done something that other people appreciate. So this next round of, of, uh, of effort and media for us has got to accomplish a number of things. We want to curate experiences that fuse people's unheard stories. We don't necessarily want to just use polished media as the messenger. We want to include uh, issue-oriented communities and, and make it a much more involved uh, technology. And so the result will hopefully turn people into much more agents of rapid change rather than just consumers of entertainment. Our science team, as an example, has created, uh, the science team at, of Nature Needs Half has created a multimedia map, which uh, you'll be able to see on our platform, uh, describing the 847 ecoregions in the world. Each time you mouse over a little area, all the aspects of that particular ecoregion become clear and you, you know what's needed. You can go back and forth between the countries and the ecoregions to see which countries are part of what ecoregion. So this is what the Nature Needs Half platform looks like. Uh, we have a signature video in the beginning, and we have uh, a carousel of short videos, and down below we have what we call the impact zone and impact tiles, and you click on those by clicking on the impact button. Um, and over time, we're going to be able to accelerate this impact and feed with the platform being the center of all of this, uh, people getting involved in particular impacts and being able to then share, uh, share that. We hope to write, as we're raising funding, a new algorithm for impacts themselves so people can initiate a, a, a petition or initiate actions or involve themselves in some sort of effort or meeting. And as they do that and share that with their friends, they're creating impact. And each day, their friends start to do more, and, and the number of impacts start to pile up. So at the end of a day, someone can check their social media and see, well, how much impact did I create from signing that petition or from attending that meeting or suggesting that people see this movie? So all of that is kind of a new register for social media, beyond shares, beyond likes. We want to create impacts as the measurement of social media for the 21st century. So this button, the impact button, will be right next to the share button, the join button, you'll be able to donate. And as we develop this platform, it will uh, be a very uh, elegant way for people of all ages to participate in the movements that we're creating. It's part of a harmonious concept that we have as a company to combine the, uh, the, the, the impacts with our values and with the kind of media and innovation that we hope to do. Uh, coming out of Silicon Valley, we are located in the heart of where this stuff can all begin. So thank you very much. You can see the Nature Needs Half Science Teams project at natureneedshalf.org. And you can experiment today either on mobile or on your computer with the web channel itself at natureneedshalf.tv. I hope you'll all join uh, today or as soon as you can and become members of the Nature Needs Half community.